The fact that sine was continuous, so it pushed our limb through the sine function. And that worked out. So our next problem we'll do a similar limit, except we'll take x times sine 1 over x. So it's going to be limit x approach infinity x sine 1 over x. So let's do the naive thing and just plug in infinity and see what we get. So we get sine 1 over infinity. And 1 over infinity we know is 0. And what is sine of 0? Zero? 0. So what's infinity times 0? Zero? Zero. Maybe. So if we look, so how did we get here? We had a number that was getting really big multiplied by a number that was getting really small. So the question is, is that product going to get bigger and bigger or smaller and smaller or something different? Uh, we won't precisely look at this until Calc 2, but we will at this point be able to, hopefully the problems I give you, we'll be able to use algebra and what we know to figure out what this limit actually is. So I'm going to put a big question mark through this, and we will figure out more carefully what is going on. So <coughs> I could change the form. So what did I do algebraically? between the first line, the original problem, and the second line. So everything is the same except what I circled in green. So what did I do? So, I, so what I call this is kicking a factor to a denominator. And the way you do it is you basically raise it to a negative first power, or write it as it's reciprocal. Generally, we would go this way. We would start on the second line and then simplify to the first line. However, they're equal, and you don't always want to simplify everything. So that's more of a guideline than a rule, is simplify things. So we're going to, in purpose, unsimplify. So any questions on why these are equal? You may question why I'm doing my motivations, why I'm doing this. But it should be pretty clear that they're equal. So why am I doing this? Well, what I did is I turned this into a form where it's sine of a thing divided by the thing. So what's inside the green circles is the same. So I'm going to make a substitution or a change of variable. And I'll do this in the blue right here. So let, let's go with y equals 1 over x. And now I'm going to change this limb around. Well, sine y over y looks pretty familiar. The problem is this limit value doesn't match the variable in the uh, expression. So I need to change this around here. So I need y to approach something. The question is, what does y approach as x approaches infinity? So I have to figure out, what does y approach? And we write that out mathematically as lim x approaches infinity of y. Lim x approaches infinity, y is 1 over x. And what is this limit here? Limit 1 over x when x gets really big. This one is 0, because our denominator gets bigger and bigger. So our fraction is 0. So the answer to what does y approach when x approaches infinity, it approaches 0 right here. So we just answer that question, y approaches 0. So what we did is we changed variables carefully and then 
because we changed variables in our expression, we had to change our limit variable. And uh, it approached a different number. This limit's familiar. What is this limit equal to? It's a special limit you were supposed to memorize. So I know you did. This is one. So that's one of the two special limits you had to memorize. That is how to change variables in a limit. I want you to solve this limit here, figure out what we're approaching. And it may be infinity, negative infinity, or a number. So it could be any of those three. And when you do this, remember the weird algebra trick that I showed you. I'll put that on the screen for a couple seconds. Here's that weird algebra trick that we did. So you multiply by the highest uh, 1 over the highest power of x in the numerator and denominator. So you're going to do this trick right here. And what is our highest power in this expression? It will be x squared. So you're going to multiply 1 over x squared, 1 over x squared. So that's your step one. So you could do an algebra zone, but it's probably faster to not start a separate algebra zone. You're not going to do that much algebra here. It's only one or two steps. Any algebra or calculus questions so far? So this is not 0 over 0. This is 1 over 0. So anytime you have non-zero over 0, it's generally going to be infinity or negative infinity. We just have to decide which one we're going to uh, choose. So there's a few ways to do this. The numerator is positive. It's positive 1 minus a small, uh, tiny quantity. So numerator is positive. Let's decide if the denominator is that tiny number going to be positive or negative when x is really big. So we're going to make that decision. So 1 over 0 is a tiny number? No. Okay. It's going to be infinity or negative infinity. We need to decide which one. Uh, so I have to decide, is what I circled positive or negative? And what we're really going to look is We really need to look the step before, before we write 0 minus 0. 0 minus 0 doesn't really tell us if it's positive or negative. It'll just tell us 
close to zero. So we're going to look here. So we know it's going to be a tiny quantity, but the question is, is it a positive or negative tiny quantity when x is really big? <coughs> so there's a few ways to do this. We could rearrange this, uh, go common denominator, 2x minus 4 over x squared. So I added them together. So this forms a little bit better. Uh, for determining positive or negative. If we think when x is approaching infinity, well, x squared is always positive. That's never going to be negative. So what about the numerator? Positive or negative in the numerator? Two x minus four. So if x is 100, positive or negative? Positive. x is a million. Positive. That minus 4 is not going to make it negative unless x is relatively small, like 2 or less. That's when it would be negative. So positive, positive. So take two positive numbers, divide them, you get a positive number. So our fraction is greater than 0. So we have 0 from the positive side which means we're approaching positive infinity, not negative infinity. Yeah, so if it was like 0 over 1, you just say that's 0. There's no, it doesn't matter. You don't need to say positive 0 or negative 0. If, if it mattered, you could probably figure out which way you were approaching 0. So then if there's a 0 in the denominator, then you have to do more work. Yes. So yeah, basically dividing by 0 is a lot more difficult. You have to think a lot more than having 0 over a number. Okay. How do we find that it's infinity? How do we get from 1 over 0 to infinity? One over zero. So one over a tiny number is a big number. But the question is, is that a negative tiny number or a positive tiny number? So if it was a negative tiny number, like one over you know, negative point zero 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 one is a large negative number. Mm -hmm. And so if you keep shrinking that, if this was zero from the negative side, I would have negative infinity. Does that make sense? Like positive 1 over a small negative quantity gets very, uh, I don't want to say small, but a very large magnitude negative number. Okay. So 1 over 0 is infinity? Or negative infinity. Or negative depends infinity. on which. Uh, and if you are on a double, s the good news is these infinite limits, when we approach infinity, you can't approach from the, it's, it's a one-sided limit. Uh, because here's the number line, here's infinity, negative infinity. If you're going to approach one of these two, you're never going to approach infinity from that side. So you're only, and likewise, negative infinity, you're never going to approach negative infinity from the negative side. So those are one sided limits, basically. Okay. Yes, sir? So this, this, this down was one, if you have like three over zero, you still be infinity. Oh, that would be three times infinity, which is infinity. So anytime it's not 0 over 0, then it's going to generally be infinity or negative infinity. Well, it's not just numerator. If, the, if it was negative negative, it would also be positive infinity. Okay. So it depends not just the numerator, but the numerator and denominator signs. If they're both negative, it's just regular fraction rules. If they're both negative, you get a positive. If they're both positive, you get a positive. If one is negative, one is positive, then you get negative. I was just wondering if it matter one number the It really only matters the sign, if it's positive or negative. Okay. So this method I showed you, the algebraic method, is the 
fully correct way, but what I'm going to show you is a much faster way, and I call it the physicist method. And if you were following along with what the intuitive part of this, why did this go to infinity? Because the numerator beat the denominator. The numerator had basically a higher power of x. So when x got really big, the numerator squared that huge number. The denominator took that huge number, multiplied it by 2. So once you get past 2, x equals 2, the numerator is going to be uh, growing much faster. Uh, you know, if x is 100, 100 squared is way bigger than 200. Once you're talking about millions and billions, and whatever comes after that, you square that number, it gets way bigger than 2 times. So that is how we're going to proceed. We're going to look at basically who has the higher power of x. And that side will win. So this is what I call the physicist method for infinite limits. And this works for lim x approaches infinity and works for lim x approaches negative infinity. It does not work for x approaches a number. When a is a number. So if you're approaching a number, you cannot use this method whatsoever. So I'm going to do an example. Well, let me write down really briefly what it, this method is. You're going to throw out, or keep only the highest power in the numerator and denominator. So we're going to keep only the highest degree in the numerator and denominator. So we're going to keep two terms, the numerator, the leading term, and the denominator leading term. So we're going to use a physicist method here. What is the highest degree term in the numerator? Seven. So we have degree 7 term, and we're going to keep, and you don't just keep x as 7th, you keep the entire term. The 5 goes with it. And denominator, these are in increasing order, so denominator is that first term, negative 7 x to the 5th. So I'm going to use a green equal sign. So this, we're using the physicist method across this equal sign. So I threw out all the small terms, and the limits are still the same. And we can do algebra now, and this is actually a relatively easy limit. We have negative 5 sevenths times x squared. And we can use our constant multiple rule, move that negative 5 sevenths out front. What is the limit of x squared when x approaches infinity? So what happens if you take a big number and square it? It gets bigger. So if you keep making that number bigger and bigger and squaring it, that square is going to get bigger and bigger. So we get infinity out of here. You could write infinity squared, but it's really just infinity. Except our answer is infinity times a negative number, which is negative infinity.
So you can think of infinity as absorbing whatever constant's next to it when you multiply, unless that constant is zero, in which case you have to work a lot harder. So infinity times a negative number is negative infinity. Infinity times a positive number, positive infinity. And if infinity times zero, who knows? You have to do a lot more work. I recommend you use the physics method. It will go a lot faster than um, doing all the algebra. So use the phys physicist method on both of these problems and figure out what limit values you get. So you're just keeping high powers. I didn't write them in increasing order. You don't have to hunt that hard, that far. You just have to look at the two terms and find the higher power. Don't assume every rational function is going to be written with the high power term in the front. So are there any questions on the work that I have on the board so far? I haven't actually applied the limit yet. I've used a limit rule to bring the constant multiple out front after I did the physicist method. So what is our limit of x as x approaches infinity? So it'll be, so it'll be one. I'm going to bring over the one negative one third, and we just have infinity. This is the identity limit right here, where you're just taking that value and dropping it where you see x, basically. And this is negative times infinity, which is negative infinity. And our second limit, x approaches negative infinity. It's really similar, except we get negative infinity. So identity limit again, we're just dropping a negative infinity. But this time, we have negative times negative. So we're going to get positive infinity. So negatives still cancel out when you multiply. So you know. Except in the weird infinity times zero case. That's the weird case. That's, an That's not an answer. That means you have to do more work. Okay. And in this class, that means do some algebra. This function right here, if you notice, the numerator was exactly one degree above the denominator. So when your degree of your numerator equals one plus degree of denominator, the end behavior is called an oblique asymptote. So 
So normally we would draw end behavior. I'll draw the regular end behavior up here that we got before. So we go to the right, negative infinity, and to the left, pause. so up on the left, down on the right is what we just figured out. <coughs> when the numerator wins by one, you actually can get more precise about your oblique asymptote. And if you look right here, both of these, you can see it happening. Your asymptote is going to have a slope of negative one third. And what does a line with a slope negative one third look like? It's going to look something like this as end behavior. So if you drew your graph, you could get very precise about your end behavior. It's going towards infinity on the left and negative infinity on the right, but it's going there along a, uh, getting closer to a straight line. It's not going there like a uh, quadratic mite where it would bend downwards at the end. So this one would go there like a line. This will be on the web work, but not. I won't ask you about oblique asymptotes on your midterm or uh, quizzes. This is just for homeworks only. On your quiz, I'll be completely OK with the end behavior that I have at the top of the board here. So if I ask you on a midterm or a quiz, the end behavior that's right here, that's completely OK to just tell me that. Up on the left, down on the right. That's all I need to know. Oh, you want the cloud? Yeah, cloud. Or you can tell me with uh, the cloud's really nice because it is a good way to check your graph. So this is only, only for homework right here, not for, I won't put on a quiz or a midterm. So that's pretty much the end of horizontal asymptotes, also known as end behavior. And so we're going to look at vertical asymptotes now. We talked about what it means, how do you find one with calculus. Obviously you take a limit. And we'll scroll back up to where we wrote that. Here we go, horizontal asymptote. If you only have to take your one-sided, I don't know, that's not what I want. Did I not talk about vertical asymptotes? Oh, I took, all right, here we go. We took a one-sided limit. So here's our original one over x. We knew there was vertical asymptote because we were so smart and took pre-calculus. And the way we detected it using calculus is we took limits at zero, but we had to go individually one side, then the other side. And if I erase half of this graph, would you still say it's a vertical asymptote? Yep. So it only takes, uh oh, where's my undo? It only takes one of the two sides to get a vertical asymptote. You don't need both sides. So when you were going to show me there's vertical asymptote, you only need to choose one of the two sides, either from the right, from the left. It's up to you. Generally, it's easier to go from the right because you have positive. So I generally just say go from the right side. It's a little bit easier. So we'll write that down here. We're in vertical asymptotes now. So they look like x equals a, and there's two ways uh, we, could, we could approach if, let's go, so check with either limit x approaches a from the right, or Lim x approaches a from the left. And you need to get either infinity or negative infinity. That's the only way you can call it a vertical asymptote. If you show on one of the two sides, you got infinity or negative infinity. 
So there's four possibilities. You could approach on the right side at the bottom, or you could approach from the right side at the top. And that would be, this first one up here would be limb x approaches a positive fx equals infinity. The one on the bottom, limb x approaches a from the positive side, f of x equals negative infinity. So the positive one is a from the right, positive infinity. The negative one is a from the right, negative infinity. And if I look on the left side, there's two options over here. I could approach the top or the bottom side on the left. And the top side is similar. Lim x approaches a from the negative side. And we get positive infinity or lim x approaches a from the negative side fx equals negative infinity. So those are the two we could have on the left. You only need one of these four. So obviously a function won't have both. So you'll, ha you'll have one of the two. So let's find all vertical asymptotes. of f of x equals x squared minus 4 times x plus 1 over x squared minus 3x plus 2. So find all vertical asymptotes. There should be at least one, maybe two. So you have to do some algebra first, and then you have to take some limits. And I recommend go on the right side. I'll factor the numerator, you factor the denominator. So you should have gotten two potential x values, and now I have to take two limits.
I'm going to choose right side. So x approach is one positive. I'm going to use the simplified version. Why am I definitely not allowed to use the physicist method here? So we may have an infinite y value that we're approaching, but we're not approaching an infinite x value. So I'm approaching one and two. Those are definitely not infinity or negative infinity. So at this point, 2 is not a vertical asymptote. 2 is not a vertical asymptote because I did not get infinity or negative infinity on my limit here. So we're approaching 12 when x is approaching 2 from the right side. Uh, if I approach 2 on the negative side, that plus or that minus didn't matter. I could approach 2 on the negative side, I would get the same exact number. So not, not an asymptote. So 2 is out. Now for 1, x equals 1, are there any questions on just plugging in that value? What do I have to do? I got 6 over 0. What do I need to do to decide if this is positive or negative infinity? If you just see 6 over 0, you can't determine it from that. So what I have to do is back up and decide x minus 1, positive or negative, when we are close to 1 on the right side. So let's figure that out. It'll probably be positive, so let's figure out is, so we'll go down here, is x minus 1 greater than 0 or is x minus 1 less than 0 when x approaches 1 from the positive side. So what does it mean to approach 1 on the positive side? Here's 1, here's x, and x is going, I should say, to the right, to the left. It's going to the left, from the right. But anyways, we agree with the picture. It's approaching from the right from the positive side. So if I write an inequality for 1 and x, which one is bigger? x is bigger, so x is greater than 1. That's what it means to approach from the right side. How can I use this equality to get to that inequality? Of course, we're going to use algebra to get there. So I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to solve for x minus 1. I'm going to solve for x minus 1. So how do I turn x into x minus 1? So I have to subtract 1 from both sides. Subtracting is OK because it's not going to flip my inequality around. So adding, subtracting, any number is not going to change your inequality. So we're going to go. Switch back, 1 less than x. We're going to subtract 1 from both sides. 1 minus 1 less than x minus 1. So we got 0 is less than x minus 1. So that means x minus 1 is positive. We really relied on the fact that we were approaching from the right side. If I was approaching on the left side, this would be negative, not positive. So we are definitely uh, dependent on the side we're approaching. I would get the opposite if I was approaching on the other side. All right, so that means x minus 1 is positive. 
So the zero that we see is a positive number. So that's what we just determined, that x minus 1 was positive. So yes, it is going to get very small, but it's going to be a very small positive number, not a very small negative number. And that is 6 over positive 0. What makes this positive infinity, not negative infinity? We are going to turn this into a graph. The only thing I can really graph off of this, if I really quickly turn this into a graph, x equals positive 1. On the right side was positive infinity. So I can fill in the right side of the uh, vertical asymptote. That's about all I know. And so we got negative 3 was no, 2 was 12. I could 2. It'll be removed, but that'll be 12 right there. That's about all I really know from the work that I've done. There's a remove point, but the y value does approach 12. I think we know it approaches 12 on both sides, so it's going to look something like that. Now we're going to do vertical asymptotes of some trig functions. x is 1 is our vertical asymptote. So now we're going to do vertical or asymptotes of trig functions. And we're going to use graphs for these. So we'll start out with sine and cosine. Here's a graph of sine and cosine. Any vertical asymptotes? Nope. We're never going past 1 and negative 1, so we're definitely not going to get anywhere near infinity. So no, no way vertical. What about horizontal? Do we ever approach some y value? No matter how far you go to the right, the graph looks exactly the same. It keeps jumping around everywhere. So we got no asymptotes whatsoever for sine and cosine. So sine and cosine of no asymptotes. And we'll go to tangent. So for tangent, find all vertical asymptotes. There's more than one. There's more than four. There's more than any number you'll think of. There's an arbitrarily large number, yeah, and infinitely, infinite many, infinitely many. All right, so figure out where they are and write down at least a limit for one of them. And do the positive side. So you get infinite A values, just pick the nicest one, the one that's closest to zero, and go with that one.
So I think two periods of tangent is enough to get the idea of what's going on, a pattern that's repeating. So we get vertical asymptotes separated by our period, which is pi. So if you move over another pi, you get another vertical asymptote, 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 asymptote. So we'll just pick pi over 2 as our first one, and then just add as many pi's as we want to. So are we just supposed to use the graph? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll do a one-sided limit in a, in a minute here. So our vertical asymptotes, x equals pi over 2 plus pi k. And you have to specify that k has to be an integer. You can't pick 1 half or a third. It has to be an integer. So we're going to show 1 with a limit. And I said go. we'll pick the positive pi over 2, not the negative pi over 2. And we'll approach that from the right side. So if we look at the graph, what does the graph tell us if we approach pi over 2 on the right side? So I wrote a little arrow there so we can see approach pi over 2 from the right side. That's that green arrow. And we're going to be going down to negative infinity. Now, if you don't have a graph, how do you do this? Well, what we just looked at is rational functions. So let's write this. We can't write it as a rational function, but we can write it as sine over cosine. No, cosine, sine over cosine. So what is sine of pi over 2? What is cos pi over 2? Sine is positive 1. What is cosine? 0. Now we have the same problem we had before. Is this a positive 0 or a negative 0? And we have to decide what's happening. It's harder to figure that out with the trig function than it is with a polynomial. But if you think about pi over 2, what does cosine look like around pi over 2? Cosine looks like this right here. Here's cosine of pi over 2. So it's 0 on the positive side. Uh-oh. There's 0, so we get positive infinity. Uh-oh. What did I do wrong? Did I approach pi over 2 on the correct side? Nope. So yes, cosine does look like that over there, but I need to approach on that side with the cosine function. So it's actually 0 from the negative side which is negative infinity. This is just out of the uh, cosine graph right here. All I did was graph y equals cos x. And I found the limit right there. I needed to know. I knew it was going to 0. I just needed to know positive on one side, negative on the other. And it was important that we were approaching from the positive side. In this case, we got negative 0.